As a child, Oda was originally inspired to write a story by pirates from watching a cartoon called Vicky the Viking. So it seems like from its conception, One Piece was always destined to be a seafaring adventure. But considering whatever initial simplistic concept of One Piece Oda must have had as a child, I wonder how much the significance of setting the story on the sea played into his ideas of what the series would ultimately be about. Because the sea has become a defining aspect of One Piece's story, and really one of the defining characteristics that make it a unique work of fiction in the first place. Now of course I want to talk about the brilliance of One Piece's world in general. The Four Blues, the Grand Line, the New World, the countless islands and nations that populate the ocean, but I think it's important to do things in the right order. So with this video, I want to focus on the absolute most basic layer of the One Piece world, the sea. I'm going to focus on the many ways this setting shapes the story as well as how it reflects the ideas of the series itself. To start with, how does the sea play into the themes of the story? Now, long-time viewers may have heard me say this already, but a quick recap for new viewers, One Piece is largely based around the idea of romance. Not romance romance, but the grander notion of romance, the sense of mystery and excitement beyond day-to-day -day life. This is the foundation of One Piece's entire story. This is the stuff dreams are made of. We are following the Straw Hats on the ultimate romantic adventure, and what better setting for the ultimate romantic adventure than the sea? After all, the sea makes for a fundamentally different expedition than, say, trekking through forests or mountains. The ocean is essentially the great unknown. This is a world where you can never see the next destination, where you don't know what's over the horizon. It's just a massive open plain, filled with mystery and potential for danger, but at the same time, boundless freedom. This setting sets the tone for the story and helps frame a lot of ideas of the narrative. On the one hand, sailing the seas seems like such an appealing prospect. It's an endless adventure with limitless potential for fun, and most importantly, it's where people can chase their dreams. But at the same time, the reality is that the sea is unpredictable and dangerous. The moment you set off to sea, you have to be prepared to throw away your attachment to life, because there's no such thing as an adventure without risk. You can't chase your dreams without giving yourself up to fate a little bit. As such, we are presented with a vast world of limitless freedom, but only for those with the guts it takes to survive, and the conviction to take the plunge into the great unknown. That's why there's so much significance attached to raising a flag and risking one's life in the first place. Not only does the sea embody the essence of the series, I would argue that it's the only setting that properly evokes the sense of romance and pure freedom that the narrative of One Piece demands. Well, maybe except for space, but who knows what the future holds. Now, again, I wonder if Oda had always planned for the story to take place on the ocean, did the themes of romance and freedom naturally come out of that, or did a pirate story just happen to fit with themes he was already interested in? We might never know for sure, but all things considered, I think you would be genuinely hard-pressed to find a series that better matches its setting to concept. Now, from a writing perspective, the sea is a really juicy setting to work with since it just naturally lends itself to a lot of symbolism. To start with, the simple fact that everything takes place on the ocean means that everyone travels around on ships, and with everyone traveling around on ships, everyone also has their own flags. The flag you fly says a lot about what you stand for, just as the ship you choose to board says a lot about the ideals you stand behind. This lends itself to a lot of metaphorical dialogue as well. For example, Bellamy is a small fry in the grand scheme of things, who wouldn't stand a chance on his own in the upcoming Great War. As such, to survive this approaching Great Wave, he's trying to make a place for himself on Doflamingo's ship, a figurative ship he believes will be able to weather the storm. And speaking of weathering the storm, in general, Oda has made full use of sea metaphors to capture the rapidly changing state of the world. The upcoming New Era has consistently been characterized as a Great Wave that is approaching, and for characters that have no place in this coming era, there is no ship that can carry them there. Ever since the return from the time skip, Oda has been dropping more and more hints that this great wave is building up, and is finally about to come crashing down, as even the Gorosei recognize that there are waves of unrest that can no longer be contained. Oda frequently punctuates this sort of dialogue with accompanying imagery of the sea to illustrate his vision. The turning point of the world and the climax of the current era kicks off with a great wave, just as the proclamation of all-out war is set to the backdrop of a turbulent ocean. Basically, while the sea inherently reflects a lot of the themes of the series, beyond that, Oda makes sure to actually use the sea to full effect, 
both in his language and visuals to paint a more vivid picture of the grander conflict in the reader's imagination. So the sea embodies a lot of ideas of the story, and similarly a lot of ideas of the story are communicated through the sea, but how does the sea influence the story itself? Well, the most immediately noticeable way is how this setting shapes the story structure of One Piece. Now there's a lot I want to say about One Piece's story structure eventually, but here I'll just talk about the basic facts. The setting makes it such that all storylines have to be split into islands. The plot can only progress from arc to arc by island to island. Because everything is so geographically distant, because the vast majority of characters of a given storyline are left behind once the arc concludes, each new arc gives us an entirely new location, entirely new cast of characters, and entirely new conflict. Now of course, this is not to say that storylines don't carry over. One Piece excels at building up larger, overarching storylines over time. But my point is that because islands are so distinct, and so drastically distanced from each other, they're like entirely different worlds. 90% of what happens in most arcs has to be built from scratch. It's like literally starting a brand new novel every time. For example, Punk Hazard to Dressrosa still carried the same overarching conflict. But the moment we got to Dressrosa, we were introduced to a million new characters and storylines. And the actual individual conflict of Dressrosa was an extremely complex, standalone narrative that we had no hint of in Punk Hazard. Pretty much every aspect of this conflict has to resolve by the end, since very few characters will be moving on to the next segment of the story, Zo. I think this works well to pace out One Piece's broader story, because in general the broader One Piece world has a lot of interconnected conflicts and storylines, but by having the actual plot progress from island to island, it allows for self-contained stories to play out one at a time in a bit of a bubble. Alabasta is its own bubble, Skypea is its own bubble, Thriller Bark, Fishman Island, even when we get to Dressrosa, although characters from pretty much all major factions make an appearance, here they're simply entering the Dressrosa bubble. It's not like the plot is suddenly taken over by the storyline of the Blackbeard Pirates or the Revolutionaries. The Dressrosa plot is its own narrative from start to finish. Now interestingly, I think the Wano storyline has the potential to be the first arc where this bubble pops, and the grander conflict of One Piece comes seeping in. Maybe this is the first island where it's no longer a self-contained story happening within the broader framework of the One Piece conflict, but rather an island that provides a setting for the broader One Piece conflict to play out. But this is of course speculation, let's wait and see what actually happens. Though I will say that even with Wano, an arc that has an unprecedented number of prior storylines feeding into it, the actual internal conflict of the story is still being built up from scratch, and an absolutely massive cast of Wano-specific characters is being introduced to us completely fresh. But generally speaking, the point I'm making is that the setting of the sea makes it so that island-based storytelling defines One Piece's story structure. I think you could say the story of One Piece is kind of like the sea itself. There's a much larger plot surrounding everything similar to the ocean, but within that ocean are islands of self-contained stories, and that's how we experience the narrative. Interestingly, as soon as an individual arc concludes, Oda tends to shift focus away from the Straw Hats and instead works on building the overarching plot. So it's kind of like, as the crew literally leaves an island and re-enters the sea, narratively we also leave a self-contained story and transition into the ocean that is the larger plot of One Piece. Alright, this is a little different from my previous points, but I couldn't make a video on this subject without discussing what sailing brings to the story, because this is an aspect of One Piece that I love too much not to talk about. So I'll end with this topic. By setting the story on the ocean instead of land, there's this entirely new dimension that is brought to the Straw Hat's travels. Thanks to the sea, simply moving forward becomes a complex task of its own, as the ocean inherently brings challenges such as storms, tsunamis, whirlpools, famine, navigation, sea monsters, and much more. Just making it from island A to island B becomes an adventure, essentially meaning that in One Piece, getting to the next adventure is its own adventure. And one of my favorite aspects of this element of the journey is that while the meat of the story does take place in the plot-heavy island adventures, the preceding sailing adventures tend to be the most light-hearted, comedic, and genuinely fun portions of the series. As heavy and serious as One Piece may get during the main story arcs, the sea is always the ultimate romantic escape awaiting the crew at the end. 
And in that vein, think about why the Straw Hat crew dynamic is one of the most beloved aspects of the story for many readers. Because the story is set on the sea, our heroes have to travel together by ship. But naturally, the ship becomes more than just a vehicle to carry our heroes forward on this grand adventure. It also becomes a home. I believe this is a large part of what makes One Piece such a feel-good series for most readers. Seeing this cast of characters working together functionally as a pirate crew, but at the same time living together under one home as a family. So much of One Piece's charm comes from the bright tone that is set by seeing this crew, this family sailing away together at the end of an arc in their home, setting off out into the wide, wide ocean, this great unknown, this open world of romance with only each other to hold on to. If you enjoyed this video, then please like, share, and subscribe. Follow me on Twitter for updates on future videos, and you can contribute directly to the creation of more videos such as this through Patreon. Benefits include voting on special polls and access to my podcast covering more topics. Lastly, I want to give a big shout out to YouTuber O'Hara for creating the thumbnail and all my thumbnails. You can check out his channel in the description below, and I want to give a big shout out to all my patrons. With special thanks to Simon Fines, Sebastian C, Ankazar, Mark S, Lun, Patron, Michael Dreyer, Benji Makoto, Schwalbe, Patrick Oland, Spike SP, Clive Mort, Paul, Lorenzo Linares, Joaquim Torenius, Wiase, Luis Aguare, Dark Eternal, Isaac Granados, Therester, Laura, Nock Lucci, Vince T, Geoff Nettlekoff, Rohanite, and Jacob Marn.